two, one. And ignition and liftoff of Ares 1X. With the cancellation of the Ares rocket program and the subsequent retirement of the space shuttle, the American manned space program is grounded. The Orion spacecraft has been built, but currently has nothing to launch it. In September 2011, NASA unveiled its alternative to the Ares rockets. Meet the Space Launch System, or SLS for short. If it looks familiar, it ought to. Like the abandoned Ares rockets, the SLS borrows heavily from the shuttle program, only here it is more straightforward. All they have done is taken the external tank and its two SRBs, fitted the base of the tank with the space shuttle main engines, and perched the Orion capsule on top. The heavy lift cargo launcher is pretty much the same design, only the Orion is replaced with an upper stage that uses a single J2 engine. As per Obama's decision, there are no plans to use these to land a man on the moon, only near-Earth asteroids and Mars. Although the preliminary and unofficial schedule, based on the worst-case budget scenario, outlines a single manned circumlunar flight in August 2021. Design-wise, I think the crew launcher is a great improvement over its predecessor. While a space plane would have been better landing-wise, it is far more sane to place the capsule on top, that way the crew is in no danger of falling debris. While I like this design in some respects, it does beg two perfectly legit questions. Firstly, if they could have, quote, returned to the moon using this technology, why didn't NASA do it sooner? It obviously has nothing to do with budget, as they have been spending billions of dollars on this exact same shuttle technology since 1981. And if they didn't bother go back because of being there, done that, why bother proposing at least one circumlunar flight in the worst case scenario? I think it's fair to say that the reason this technology was not used sooner is because the crews aboard couldn't possibly have survived the trip. Which brings us to the next question. How are astronauts going to be shielded from the space radiation? Dr. Eugene Parker estimates that a water shield surrounding a small capsule would weigh at least 500 tons. According to NASA's press release, the heavy lift SLS will carry a maximum payload of 143 tons. Even though James Van Hoften assures us that the radiation will be a show-stopping hazard on even short-term trips to the moon, the propagandists insist that this hazard only applies to long-duration missions, like going to Mars. Well, since NASA has no confirmed plans to fly to the moon anytime soon and are opting for asteroid and Mars flights, I got these two words for the propagandist community. Shut up. Until the SLS is ready to launch, NASA will be reliant on Russia's Soyuz just to get astronauts onto the ISS. And they are currently relying on the private company SpaceX to carry resupplies to the station. In addition to the Orion capsule, three private companies are working on their own manned spaceships. Boeing is currently building a seven-man capsule called the CST-100. CST for Commercial Space Transportation which will be launched either by their Delta IV, or NASA's Atlas V, or SpaceX's Falcon 9. Meanwhile, Space Dev is building a miniature shuttle called the Dream Chaser, which, like the CST, will probably be launched atop the Atlas V. Finally, SpaceX is building a manned version of their Dragon capsule, the unmanned version of which is already commissioned to carry cargo to the ISS. While both the CST and Dream Chaser are intended for a seven-month stay in Earth orbit, there is a proposal to use the Heavy Lift Falcon 9 to launch an unmanned Dragon capsule to Mars by 2018. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has stated that his company's ultimate goal is to land a man on Mars within 10 or 20 years. This time slot, if successful, would beat Obama's proposal of landing a man on Mars at some unspecified date after 2035. This may come as a shock to you all, but I have a level of faith in the Red Dragon. If you remember back to my Mars Vega series, Ralph Rene doubted NASA's unmanned Mars missions because they all supposedly landed there using parachutes. 
Due to the extremely low density of Mars' atmosphere, Rene believed that the parachutes could not possibly have operated correctly under those near vacuum conditions. I honestly wonder if the guys at SpaceX saw my series, or perhaps read Rene's book, because unlike NASA's Mars missions, the Red Dragon will not use parachutes. From what I understand, the capsule will instead perform a propulsive landing, meaning that it will use rockets to land on Mars, not parachutes. This takes away an element of doubt that Rene and I had regarding the previous unmanned landings. And if successful, the only thing stopping men from landing on Mars will be radiation. Well, good luck with that. The payload to uh, Mars would be about a quarter of, of its payload to, to Leo. Um, so we're talking about perhaps something like uh, 30,000 pounds to trans Mars injection. And to the moon? Uh, to the moon, it, it'll be about maybe 30, uh, 30 35% of that. So it's, it's uh, sort of maybe 30, 35,000 pounds. 30,000 pounds is equal to only 15 tons. To shield astronauts on a flight to Mars, we would need 33 times that mass. This is well outside the lifting capacity that the Falcon Heavy can send to Mars, or even to the Moon. So sadly, while it may very well be possible for the Falcon Heavy to send the Dragon all the way to Mars, and while it may very well be possible to make propulsive landings onto the surface, until we can lift heavier payloads to the Moon and Mars, SpaceX's dreams will be just that. Dreams. I will finish up today's video with this. As some of you may have noticed from my YouTube channel, I am currently doing my BSc in Astrophysics. Some have asked what I plan to do with my degree. It is quite simple. I plan to chase my dreams. Once I get my BSc, I will train towards my pilot's license. Then after I get a thousand hours under my belt, I will apply for astronaut training. Now by no stretch of the imagination do I plan on becoming a NASA astronaut. No, I plan on offering my services to the private sector. I'd be delighted to work as a tour guide, flying tourists aboard the various spacecrafts that Virgin Galactic and Space Adventures are building for orbital and suborbital flight. I'd also be quite happy to work as a pilot, ferrying crews and payloads to the ISS. But what I really want to do in my career is fly the Red Dragon. I realise that it is very unlikely that the radiation issue will be sold within 10 to 20 years from now. But as is the case with my Fly Jarrett to the Moon project, I am not afraid to put my life on the line for the sake of the truth. Both the Lunar Tourism Soyuz and the Red Dragon mission will be beneficial to believers and disbelievers in the moon landings alike, as both programs will require me to cross over the Van Allen radiation belt and live outside the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere for at least a week. Regardless of which mission I end up taking, if I last a week without cancerous effects, or even the hour it will take me to cross the radiation belt, then NASA might have a claim. So I shall continue to raise money until I either hit the required $300 million for the Soyuz tickets, or after my eventual astronaut training, I am selected for the Red Dragon mission, whichever comes first. But the bottom line is, mankind needs to explore, and until we can get the radiation problem out the way, mankind will never leave the cradle. If I die as of the result of space radiation, I hope people will use the information gained to further mankind into the cosmos. It was always my dream to someday walk on Mars, and I must face the perils of the journey to ensure that either I, or some future traveller long after my time, will somehow be able to live that dream. I will either die one of the first men to walk on Mars, or die trying.